Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. So in previous lectures, we looked at different types of medical imaging. The question now is, given the data that we collect from our scanners, how do we reconstruct the true distribution of radiopharmaceutical inside a patient? We'll examine some basic mathematical techniques like back projection and eventually filtered back projection to get a pretty good estimate of what the distribution looks like. This will eventually lead us into some more complicated mathematical algorithms we can use that are both statistical and iterative. The most popular one used in actual clinical applications today is known as the maximum likelihood expectation maximum algorithm. Anyways, let's get to it. Okay, so let's not talk about tomographic image reconstruction. We just talked to you about principles of computer tomography and specifically emission computer tomography. But how do we utilize, as we just said, how do we utilize the measured projection data at various angles to generate 3D images? And the answer is tomographic image reconstruction. So let's talk about it. So there are different categories of approaches to image reconstruction. It's a very active field of research, has been for decades and continues to be. Um, if, if there's different ways to categorize image reconstruction algorithms. And in this lecture, we're not gonna get to very technical mathematical details. This lecture is intended to be more broad, to give you, to be accessible to a wider audience and to just sort of give you the general paradigms of image reconstruction. And, uh, and I hope that in the future, we will also talk about more technical mathematical algorithmic aspects. But broadly speaking, you could uh, categorize image recon into analytic recon methods. Um, and a primary example of that is filter back projection, which we will talk about, and also iterative reconstruction methods. A, a very important subset of which are statistical reconstruction methods, such as the maximum likelihood expectation maximization algorithm, MLEM or order subset expectation maximization or maximum a posterior reconstruction. So we're gonna talk about these. Um, but I do wanna really emphasize something that not all iterative methods are statistical. Uh, and statistical al algorithm is something that takes the nature of noise into account. Like you model that the noise is Poisson distributed. That allows you to do really nice recons statistical. But there have been other methods that have not been statistical, that have not taken the nature of noise into account, but they were iterative, like algebraic methods, like this art method, for example. Um, so again, there, there could be, you could have iterative methods that are not st statistical, they're not modeling the nature of noise, but they're iterative. But because statistical methods are so dominant nowadays, often when somebody says iterative, they mean statistical. Um, so they're kind of broadly grouped together, but that's important to remember that. Uh, and so today also, we will really uh, talk about these two general categories and, and focus on uh, back projection and filter back projection in this category and focus on statistical reconstruction um, also in this category. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit. Um, so you could have, actually the, the most trivial reconstruction you could do is just simple back projection. So this, this, this involves the simple processing of uh, the projections and you simply, you know, you take all the projections at the different angles and just back project them into the image. Um, and so you pretty much do what, what is shown here. Okay, so you say, wait a minute, I have this point source, I'm receiving something in this angle, I'm receiving this in that angle, I'm receiving that in that angle. And you pretty much back project what you measure because you don't know where it came from, right? I mean, that, and that's a problem, right? You don't know where along this line of response or for example, along this line of response, you don't know, you've measured this, but you don't know if the source was here or here or here or here or here. So you just back project it. By the way, it turns out there's beautiful mathematics behind it. You can show that if you put noise considerations aside, if you sample the subject along all angles, you could actually reconstruct um, uh, point source or next, and point source is trivial, right? You could even have two lines of response and you're done the, where they intersect. But for an extended object, you could prove that you could reconstruct it if you're acquiring along all angles. There's beautiful mathematics behind that, which we will not talk about here. 
But for a single line of response, for a single projection, you don't know where this came from. So you're just gonna back project it all along here. You give equal probability to it having been generated from anywhere along this. And then you do it for this one, and then you do it for this one. You can sort of see that after you do multiple of these, you start to feel like, oh, probably if it's a point source, it came from here. And as you keep doing it, you're gonna get, um, you're gonna get an image. It's a simple reconstruction image, but it is not perfect. It's, you can sort of see that it does have background and it may also have you know, star type of artifacts, uh, depending on the number of projections. So if you only use two projections, whether four or eight projections, you're just back projecting all these. You can sort of see these star, star patterns. Uh, so, so this is the kind of reconstruction you get. This is just simple back projection. So you do get star-like patterns, but the more projection angles you do, the better the image. And finally, the image is somewhat blurred. So it's not great. Here's an example of this is the truth. This is what you could simulate this. You would take this image before projected at, at all angles, and then you try to do reconstruction along two angles, four angles, 8, 16, 32, and you end up with this kind of reconstruction. It sort of resembles this, but it's not perfect, right? The, the contrast is not, is not the best. Um, yeah. So, so then you start thinking, wait a minute, is there a way I could be first filtering? This is not intuitive at first. You, if you filter the, the projections before you back project them, you could actually end up with an image that looks far better than when you haven't filtered. But you would be wondering, well, why would I filter and back project? So this is sort of showing the end first, saying we, by filtering and then back projecting and therefore filtered back projection, we could get far better images. So what is this filter that can do the job? So again, here's an example of the original image that for example, you could simulate or you could measure on a scanner. This is a back projection image, does not look fantastic. It does not look great at all actually. And this is when you do filtering and then back projection it looks far better. So what is this filtering operation? So again, let's take a step back. Back projection, you're just back projecting lines of response onto the image, but you end up with this sort of high background that is happening. So if you have your signal like this and you start to filter it, for example, with a sync function, and we will talk about this, and then you back project, it looks kind of weird. Why would you even do that and then back project? It almost seems like it's gonna make the image worse, but it ends up making the image far better. Um, so just a toy example, imagine this is your object, your true object, your four projecting along this line, which means you're adding all these counts. So you get 18, 14, one. And then let's say you're projecting along this line too, <clears throat> and you get these numbers. Um, okay, so now let's, okay, so we, remember we measured this 18, 14, one. So let's back project them. Well, 18, I don't know where it came from. So I'm just gonna give equal numbers to all these pixels. I don't know where this 14 came from. So I'm gonna equally give it to these pixels. So you do it for these angles. And then for these two numbers, nine, you know, three numbers, 959, you do a similar thing. You back project them, back project, and you add them up. So you get something like this. So this is your back projection reconstruction. And you see the numbers when you compare it with, with the original truth, they're not so great. But if you do, um, filtering step first and then back project, you actually end up with numbers. For example, look at the central pixel. You actually end up with numbers that are closer to the truth that are better. Okay, and it turns out again, if you're sampling at all angles, this example is only for two angles, going like this and then going like that. If you do at all angles and you have sufficient sampling, actually it turns out filter back projection can give you the true original image. So what is this filter? or uh, you know, magical filter that is able to do this. It turns out because of some very interesting mathematics that we hope to get to in, in future lectures, that if we do this convolution process, you know, adding multiplying points by different um, numbers and adding them up, this filtering process, that if we convolute our projection profiles with a sort of a, filter that looks like this. This is a sort of a sync looking, it's not a strictly a sync function, it's a sync looking uh, like a scaled and shifted sync function um, that um, you can actually, if you do that process and then do the back projection. So you look at each projection profile and you do this convolution with this kind of a uh, 
uh, function if, or filter here, and then you do the back projection, then uh, the blaring that you get from the simple back projection will be removed. And so, so let's get a better feel about what this filter is doing. Uh, and that requires us, of course, understanding the uh, Fourier analysis and the Fourier transform, um, which, which, which is obviously, which is uh, something that many, many of you uh, have heard about, have worked on. Uh, but just as a general, very quick, brief uh, introduction to that, essentially we're used as human beings to think of objects in the spatial domain, but you could have a equivalent representation of any signal, including an image in the Fourier domain. Um, and that basically means that you're sort of any signal, uh, including image, you can aim to represent it as a linear combination of various frequency waveforms like sines and cosine uh, signal. So in this case, you know, this central point in the frequency domain corresponds to like a DC, like a flat background effect. And then as you move away from the center, you're getting higher and higher and higher and higher frequency representations um, of this image. So, so when you start thinking about an image in the frequency domain transform, um, then things become interesting. I can actually think about this function differently. It turns out because of the so-called convolution theorem that convoluting the spatial you know, projection profiles um, that we are having in the projections, you know, profile through projection uh, with the spatial filter that we mentioned here, um, is equivalent to simply multiplying the frequency domain representation of our projections with the frequency domain representation of this filter, which turns out to be a simple ramp filter or a ramp function, which looks like this, which basically says, um, as you increase the frequencies, I'm going to give a higher weight to the frequencies. So again, you could be taking the projection profiles and then filtering them like this in the spatial domain and then doing the back projections. Or you could be taking the projection profiles into the Fourier domain, looking at their uh, 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 frequency decomposition and then multiplying those by this weight function, by this ramp filter. Um, and then once you do that, then you could do a reconstruction and get, um, uh, uh, much improved images uh, compared to simple back projection. So what, what does that even mean? So intuitively, just to give you guys a little bit of insight. So, so let's say you're focusing on your image, meaning projections here. Uh, uh, often in the spec world, you know, when somebody says image, you have to be careful. Are you talking about the projection image or are you talking about the reconstructed image? So here we're talking about the projection image or just a, let's call it projections or projection image data. So you may have uh, a certain distribution that you're getting that, that um, looks like this. We end up getting a lot of, and this is in the frequency domain, by the way. We, we tend to get a lot of signal in our projections that are at very low frequencies. And the reason is because, the reason is because when you're projecting things, you do end up with this significant background effect because everything is being added up. So you get significant presence of low frequency signal here. And the beauty of the, or what the RAM filter effectively does because you're multiplying that signal with this uh, yellow curve, which is a RAM function. Um, you're sort of saying, wait a minute, this stuff is really mostly happening because of the um, projection effect. I wanna disregard the, this part. And I really want to emphasize the higher frequencies. Now, if you're really, really high frequency, then that might be just noise. But then this tends to end up giving you, uh, you know, emphasis on the mid frequencies, um, especially. Um, so the high frequency component of the projection image contains mainly noise. The low frequency comp uh, component, especially the really low frequency component, is the projection blaring. And so the ramp tackles these and tries to downgrade them because remember the ramp is like this. It, it de-emphasizes low frequencies and emphasizes the high frequencies more. And so it's really the mid-range frequencies that represent most of the image structure. So, so the shape of the ramp itself, uh, the ramp is fine, perfect if you don't have any noise. 
But if you do have noise in your images, the ramp, remember how it emphasizes high frequency, it could end up actually really blowing up the, the noise present in the images. So now filter back projection, which was really designed in the idealistic scenario, uh, in the idealistic scenario of, um, uh, of not having noise, now finds issues in the presence of noise because it may actually amplify the really high frequency signal. So then people then modify the ramp uh, function itself. There are many different filters to do that. So, okay, so the ideal scenario where there is no noise, ramp works perfectly fine. But then, because again, remember, these are the high frequencies. If you do have noise, the ramp says, look, I do wanna recover the really important edge details, but it turns out the noise itself is high frequency so you have to make a compromise. You're gonna say, well, wait a minute, I, I, I do wanna get really high resolution details, but the noise is, is, is also going to be amplified. So I'm going to make a compromise and I'm going to sort of de-emphasize these really, really high frequencies to, to lower the noise. So you could come up with all sorts of different modifications to the ramp filter in order to deal with this problem. So again, there are many different uh, models beyond the ramp. You could have Butterworth timing, you know, all kinds of things that happen. Um, and again, just to emphasize that point, if you use the unmodified the original ramp, you run into two problems. You can increase the noise significantly. And also, because you're allowing, if you're allowing using the ramp filter the, the, for frequencies above the maximum, which are resolvable, resolvable by your imaging system, so beyond the so-called Nyquist frequency, you may end up getting aliasing problems, and we're going to talk about that too. Um, so here are again examples of just modifications to the ramp filter, and look at this example. This is when, for example, we are using the original ramp. So you get high resolution, but you get a lot of noise. And but as you start sort of, uh, you know, making the making the upper frequencies kind of uh, attenuated and, and you modify your RAM filter, you end up getting these kinds of images. So you see, you're getting poorer resolution, but the advantage is that you're lowering the noise. So then there's a trade-off, right? So you have a classic resolution versus noise uh, trade-off that you're having here. And again, there are many filters to use that can be used. And which one's better? Well, the answer depends on the particulars of the imaging task. What is it that you want to image? What is the anatomy? What is the patient? Even observer preferences. Who's reading the image? Actually, they may have different preferences, right? Um, so uh, yeah, so just to move on to this discussion further, there's filtering that is, uh, that is happening uh, within the reconstruction. But after the reconstruction too, you could do further post-reconstruction filtering. Now, this typically happens in iterative reconstruction, but you could do it in filter back projection too. So here are three examples of having used, this is just an example, uh, just to give you a sense of what, these are actually PET images. So you sort of have done the exact same uh, filter back projection reconstruction, but then the post smoothing using, let's say Gaussian filter, uh, the post smoothing is, is being done at increasing amounts of the full width at half maximum of the Gaussian. You sort of see again, you're losing details, but you're also lowering resolution. Um, so here's a question for you guys. We're gonna poll you on this. Oops. Is this true or false? So let's read this together. The RAM filter, often people, you know, somebody might be asked, what's the difference between a RAM filter and a Gaussian filter? So is this true or false? RAM filter is applied in the frequency domain and allows mid and high frequencies through using uh, FBP as part of reconstruction, whereas Gaussian filter can be applied to the final reconstructed image and allows low frequencies through to reduce noise. True or false? There's many different kinds of filters. That's one thing. We just learned modified RAM filters, but also there's different categories of filters. Like, are you doing inter-reconstruction filtering? Are you doing post-filtering? And, you know, is the RAM filter done during reconstruction or after reconstruction? You know, and, and is a Gaussian filter typically done 
in a post-reconstruction sense, and what do they do? Yeah, so, right, so let's, uh, yeah, so most people have, uh, have answered cor correctly. This is true, this is true. Um, and again, the idea is the ramp field does have to let mid and high frequencies through. Otherwise, through the projection, you're losing the emphasis on those higher frequency signal that is being blared out due to projection. So this is inter-reconstruction filtering. Whereas at the end of the day, if you're doing some kind of a reconstruction and get a lot of noise, you could remove the noise um, or reduce the noise by allowing low or lower frequencies through to reduce noise, okay? So yeah, we're talking about, when we say Gaussian filtering, we're talking about, you know, uh, typical, typical Gaussian filtering, low pass uh, signals that we're talking about, low pass filters. Okay, so let's talk about aliasing. Here's an image of aliasing. Many of you might have seen these kinds of images on old TVs and things like that. This is what, you know, these kind of waves and ripples that you get. So this, this relates to the so-called Nyquist frequency, which is a maximum frequency resolvable by your imaging system, which is a function of how uh, regularly are you sampling your image? How closely spaced? What is your sampling rate? Now let's think space. So how, how, what is your sampling? in space. Um, and aliasing is the appearance of high frequency components um, that take the image of or appearance of having low frequency variations. And I know a good number of you would have seen this in other courses on radiological imaging, but just to really recap this for everyone. So there is a sampling theory, a theorem that sort of says that for you to recover spatial frequencies in a signal up to a maximum frequency, say, let's call it F max, F max. if you want to recover F max, you really need to linearly sample uh, and the linear sampling distance being delta R by this equation. Um, so here's the equation. You need to be sampling at least twice as rapid as that distance. So for example, so this is one over two F max is the equation, but you could sort of change this one over F max uh, you could call it lambda. This is in the numerator, not denominator, right? This is this is in the denominator. Two times f max is in the denominator, but here lambda is in the numerator. So half of lambda mean. Lambda mean you can think of it as like the smallest cycle length. Like let's say on this image, it would be the brick, the brick size. You're having these bricks. You want to image them properly. Turns out you have to sample at least at at half the sampling distance or the cycle length. So if these are this is these are your cycles, and lambda is this distance here, you know the the smallest cycle length that you're interested to to achieve. You the 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 sampling team tells you that you have to be sampling at least twice as fast, at least twice as fast. If you're not sampling at least twice as uh, the frequency is not twice larger than the thing you're trying to recover. Sampling is not twice as as better as the actual uh, frequency. You, you, for example, you may sample like this and you end up thinking that, oh, wait a minute, I have this kind of a waveform, which is totally not real. And it, kind of like these ripples, you start to see things that are not real. Uh, and it's happening because of the aliasing effect. Um, so, but I think in medical imaging, these are the kind of, you know, in signal processing kind of things that you learn, but in practical rule of thumb approaches, I think there's a good one. And we often don't think of the maximum resolvable you know, frequency. We tend to think of the full width at half maximum that we want to, to recover. Okay, so it turns out for practical purposes, you need to be sampling, you know, you need to have about three samples uh, for that given full width at half maximum. Okay, so your sampling rate, let's say, the, the way you're spacing your detectors that are gonna sample the image, they should be like three times finer, smaller, finer than the full width at half maximum that you wanna cover. Now, technically, even some people use maybe even, you know, as I say, it's two and a half, maybe even two, some people use this and some people even achieve this perhaps because you're doing tomography and it's you're coming from all angles. But let's just remember this formula. This is a good thing, rule of thumb to remember. Um, 
So, so here's a, a simulation that shows the sampling effect. So these are examples where you're doing the delta R. So this is how you're sampling here. The, imagine the detector is being placed here, um, being like this. And as you sample less, imagine using bigger and bigger detectors that are not fine enough to sample, you end up getting uh, two things. One is that you end up with, with uh, uh, poorer resolution, but also you end up getting um, aliasing. And that's because um, in a sense, you're under sampling your object, right? So aliasing happens when you're, you know, there's a resolvable frequency that you have or you wanna achieve, and then you're under sampling with regards to that. And that's what happens. So, so that's that. Now, so that's sampling effect. So how do we sample, right? Like detectors, how do I place my detectors? Like in my gamma cameras, how finely spaced should be the resolution of the detectors? Um, but let's not talk about angular range. So here's a question for you. So the question is, how much should a single head camera system rotate around the subject to have full tomographic coverage? Is it 90 degrees? Is it 180 degrees, 270 degrees, or 360 degrees? Because remember, we said that for you to do proper tomography, and the, the mathematics says that you, you, you have to be um, covering the subject in a full manner. So you're obtaining data at the many, 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 many angles at, at all angles. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you need to be rotating around the subject only 90 degrees? Probably not, and nobody's selecting that. Or is it gonna be 180 degrees? 270 is probably not, nobody's selecting that. So is it really 180 or 360 that you need to, to achieve? So, so it's, it's a mixed, uh, it's a mixed uh, result here. And most are saying 360 because we're literally saying you need full coverage, but actually- It's 10 o'clock. Actually, the, the correct answer is 180. And why is that? The reason is when you guys think about it, um, if, you're having, if you're having an image and you're projecting it, let's say in this direction, well, that's the same as projecting it in this direction. If you're just summing counts along a certain projection, whether you sum counts to go this way or you sum counts to go this way, that, that is supposed to give you the same number. In an ideal scenario, we're just summing counts. So technically, technically, in an ideal scenario, we're just summing counts. You're having a detector above the subject or below the subject. That's supposed to, if you have enough sufficient statistics, that's supposed to give you essentially the same numbers. So that's why the answer is 180 degrees. If you cover the subject at 180 degrees, you are covering all angles. You're not missing any projection angle because again, anything going to the bottom is supposed to be acquired uh, at the top, right? And yeah, and, and, it's, and it's exactly true. That's why, for example, when we're doing heart imaging, that's a great comment we're having here. Uh, heart imaging, especially as the heart is you know, close to this side of the body than that than the back of your body. So it, it, it makes a lot of sense to just be going at 180 degrees, not at 360 degrees. But in non-ideal scenarios, which what we have, it really depends where your organ is. If your organ is closer, you know, for example, you you know, if you're only doing 180 degrees, you're not seeing the enough counts perhaps from the back of the body. Why? Because there's attenuation happening. There's also, remember, the distance dependent resolution that we're having. So it depends on the application. But theoretically speaking, 180 degrees does cover you tomographically. So full 180 degree coverage is required to correctly sample tomographic data, but 360 degrees may instead be used in practice because resolution degradation, meaning with distance from the detectors, and also the fact that we have increasing attenuation and scatter as you're away from the face of the detector, these end up 
you know, if you're especially focusing not just on the heart, but you're looking at the whole body imaging, you're, you're, you know, it, it does make a lot of sense to go all the way around. So you're kind of dealing with these issues of distance to the detectors. Uh, and notice what happens if you're under sampling. So if you're only doing 45 degrees, very limited imaging, you get something like this and you get something like this, okay? Now these are with filter back projection type of reconstructions. If you do iterative reconstructions, iterative reconstructions um, tend to deal with fewer angles um, quite better. Uh, but, you know, just in a classic filter back projection type reconstruction, these are the kind of things that we see. Okay, so, so we know we have to surround the subject with, you know, detectors. We have to at least do imaging uh, along 180 degrees. Um, or, you know, for practical purposes, we may go all the way into 360, but those cover the various angles. But how finely should you be sampling? Kind of like the same question that we had about, you know, sampling in a, uh, let's say, by detectors, how finely are the detectors supposed to be placed? Well, how finely are we supposed to be sampling or uh, in an angular sense? How finely should we be rotating the detectors around the subject, right? And you can sort of see examples here where you, if you only use few angles, like 32 angles, you're going to get these kinds of artifacts. Whereas if you use like more, you know, higher sampling, 64 angles around the subject, 128 to 56, we get better and better images. So there are some formulas that are put out there. I mean, the, the, there's a logic behind this that sort of says, especially if you want to look at the periphery of the subject and you know proper sampling, all that stuff, you sort of think of it as uh, an arc around the field of view, which is, let's say, has a diameter D. And you want to make sure that you're sampling the object along that you know, the, the periphery uh, as finely. So you're gonna take the, the arc, the 180 degree arc, and you're going to divide it by the linear sampling distance uh, delta R. So how many angles do you need to achieve that? Turns out to be this formula. And notice that D divided by delta R, just the D part, D divided by delta R is the diameter divided by the number of samples that you're having. And that is just the number of basically samples that you have in a particular angle. Uh, but I do want to make a note that this formula is really for classic filter back projection type reconstructions. For iterative reconstruction methods, this can be relaxed. They, they definitely handle missing projections better. And there's even more advanced recon methods, right? Now, you know, people talk about compressed sensing and now in the era of artificial intelligence and et cetera which uh, we will allude to later, uh, this formula does not have to be strictly followed. So people are thinking about building, you know, partial ring PET scanners. If they have not been really successful in the past, but now with tremendous developments in advanced image reconstruction, people are really taking that field very seriously. Um, so here's a practical example. Imagine that you have a tomographic, tomographic system with six millimeter uh, full width at half maximum spatial uh, resolution, and you have a field of view that's 40 centimeters in this particular kind of camera that you have in mind. How much is the minimum required sampling interval, which essentially means the detector uh, spacing, and the number of angles to support this kind of spatial resolution? Well, okay, so you go with that um, equation that we had, that full width, you want the sampling to be about a third, at least a third, uh, Again, some people maybe may use the number half, but let's use the third of the full width at half maximum. So a third of full width at half maximum is about two millimeters. So we'd like to really be sampling every two millimeters, okay? And what this means that you're going to have the number of samples along a direction, let's say the X direction, is going to be about 200. So you're gonna need like a 200 uh, by 200, for example, um, um, you're going to have, well, think of 200. You're going to have a 200 coverage um, and you're going to, you know, go around the subject. So typically we have, you know, square reconstruction matrices. And again, you're going around this, uh, the subject. So you really would need something like a 200 by 200 uh, sampling scheme. Um, and then the number of views you would need by that, by the equation we just had before, turns out to be 314. This means in your reconstruction, you should really be using pixel sizes that are 
it should be first of all sampling like this by the detectors and also the pixel sizes themselves should be around here. And in practice, this we, we may not have this option in our camera. We may like in a reconstruction, we may have like 128 or 256. This means that you should not be using 128 reconstructions um, or you may have um, you know, under sampling and all the problems that we discussed, right? The lower resolution, aliasing, things like that. So it's better to set it to be 256 if you have to, right? Then you may say, well, wait a minute, if I set this to be 256, does that mean that I have to also increase this? At first sight, you may say, well, yes, but actually the truth is this equation is for this full width at half maximum. So you don't really have to increase this number to, to achieve this kind of a resolution. It is sufficient to do 200 samples per profile with this number of angles, but in your reconstruction matrix, you could make it even finer, like 256 by 256, and you should, it would be fine. Now, you don't wanna make it too, you don't wanna make the pixels too small because then they become really noisy and grainy. There is no need. You don't have sufficient sampling to make your reconstruction pixels so small. So there's no need for, for that. So here's a whole range of questions that you guys should take a look at and please try to attempt as you also do the uh, reading chapter associated with, with this lecture. So let's talk about statistical reconstruction. Um, so there are a number of approximations that are actually made in analytic and filter back projection type reconstructions. First of all, you're sort of assuming projections are perfect lines, line integrals, line projections through the object. Um, you are assuming that you're not really modeling noise. You assume that noise is not there. You're not modeling noise, or if it's there, I, I'm not dealing with it, it's there, you know, good luck. And, and finally, you're sort of assuming that you're having projections at all angles, really infinite number of projections. That's where the math allows you that proves that FVP works very well. But in practice, that's not the case. In practice, projections are not perfect lines. You may enter a detector and you may scatter, for example, right? And then you would be detected in a nearby detector. You may have a collimator blaring. We talked about septal penetration, we talked about you know, all kinds of things that, that might, um, or let's say septal scattering or scattering inside the uh, detectors. All these things sort of break down the, the linear assumption. Or in positron emission, you're gonna have a number of phenomena that are gonna also make you not perfect line integrals. But detector blaring is a good example. You think you went like this, but you were actually detected here because of blaring in the detectors. So, um, so you can actually model these effects. Noise, and this is very important. That's why this is, these are called statistical. You can actually model noise in there. You can model noise to be, you know, it, traditionally people have really taken Gaussian models a lot, but actually the algorithms we use a lot, like in MLEM, OSCM type of reconstructions, routinely used in clinical practice, do assume that the noise is Poisson distributed. If you do assume what the, no, the nature of the noise you're dealing with is, you can actually get better images with, with, with improved signal to noise ratios. And also you really don't have to have an infinite number of projections. And in fact, as I said a couple of times, um, if you have fewer number of angles, these algorithms tend to deal with them better. So the way um, reconstruction algorithms or uh, iterative statistical reconstruction algorithms tend to work are like this. And we're not gonna show you equations here, just the essence of it. And we hope that in the future, we will talk about uh, some equations, not in this lecture. Um, and so you, you start with an initial image guess. Um, then you start, um, you start um, here, just a second, with an initial estimate that you had. It's a guess. And initially you guess, typically you guess that it's just all ones. You don't know what's in there. So you just assume it's all ones. Then you forward project, forward project this you get a simulated projections. You're kind of saying, look, if this is my true image, here's what the projection data should look like. Okay, so you have a model like a simulator almost that gives you the supposed measured data if this was a true image. Of course, your first guess is never right, but you get something. Then you compare it with the actual measured projection, the projection data from the camera, and you compare these. And in the first iteration, these are often totally off, right? So you do the comparison, you calculate the error, or the, let's say the ratio between them, something that calculates the, the essentially how, how different they are. And then you sort of do a back projection. And then this gives you an error image that then you can, let's say, multiply by this original image estimate. Now you, start, now you have a better image estimate. 
and you keep doing this and you keep doing this and you keep doing this until you get an image whose forward projection starts to look quite similar to the actual measured data, right? This is just the, the nature of iterative reconstruction. Once you look at the map, you will see why am I having an image estimate? Why do I have it to have, start with an initial image estimate? But this is the nature of it. You start with an estimate, you go through this loop until more and more iterations where the projection data starts to look more and more similar to the actual measured data. So the question is like this, what is that image whose projection resembles my actual measured projection data, okay? So, um, and again, as, as, uh, as, uh, as we mentioned here, there's these advantages there, but there are some challenges with statistical methods. They are more complex, as you can imagine, you do have to have, you know, obviously, but that's an advantage too, you can build your model, you know, what is the model of detector blaring? You could build it in there, but it could make it more complex and therefore more time consuming. You're doing multiple iterations. But frankly, those are things that, you know, with advanced computational capabilities, um, we're doing well. So even though these are challenges, these have been dealt with properly. Nonlinearity is one issue. Reconstruction of A plus B is not, unlike filter back projection, uh, in statistical area recon, recon of A plus B is not equal to recon of A plus recon of B. And so that might have some implications. If you're, for example, having half the counts or a 10th of the counts, that doesn't mean you're gonna get a 10th of the image. And suddenly things might become strange when you have very, very, very few counts in iterative reconstruction methods. Um, their performance is really good when you have acceptable number of counts. When you have really small number of counts, they may break down or not perform well. Uh, and speaking of which, they can really result in overestimation in certain areas or when you, have, when you have really poor statistics or in really cold and low count regions, you may actually have a, a positive bias. You know, the count is supposed to be on average zero in a cold region, but you may end up measuring something higher. Uh, this re is related to non-negativity constraints, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, if you have poor counts or you're looking at really uh, uh, cold or low count regions, there, there, there may be challenges with these algorithms. But essentially, once you iterate more and more and more, you start to get something that looks better and better like the image. And again, if you plot bias versus noise for typical count rates, the iterative methods tend to do better. So, the, so with more iterations, you would be moving in this direction. As you iterate more, you get less and less and less bias, but you do end up getting more and more noise. And that's a challenge. So you don't want to iterate way too much because the images do get noisier and noisier. But the point is when you compare iterative and analytic with typical count rate statistics um, for fixed bias, for same bias, you may end up getting less noise in the iterative reconstructions, right? Uh, or if you say with the same noise, you would get less bias. So they tend to be in typical scenarios, they tend to do um, better and quite better. And that's why in clinical practice, this is the norm now in nuclear medicine imaging. There are of course examples where people do filter back projection, but really more and more and more and more people have really switched to these kind of reconstructions. So iter iterative algorithms uh, can uh, incorporate factors which account for, you know, things like attenuation, scatter, detector resolution, you know, all kinds of things that add complication that filter back projections methods may not be able to deal with properly. Um, and so this is a really very important formula. There's a beautiful history behind it. Uh, this is an example of, you know, people with uh, mathematical and statistical and physics inclinations have, have made a big difference in patients' lives. When they have discovered that, you know, these kinds of algorithms can do better. You know, you go back to the math, you go back to the statistics, you go you try to understand the nature of noise. You model all of these phenomena, you model the physics of your system and you get better and better and better reconstruction images. So you're, you know, you're improving, you're contributing to, to healthcare without a question. And that has made a tremendous difference in, in our field by people like yourselves. Um, yeah, so, so, and again, iterative techniques are really using PET and spec in the interest of time, I really would like to wrap up fast here. Um, so nowadays, um, this is the most common approach used. You may speed up MLEM algorithms using the OSEM algorithm, ordered subsets expectation maximization, where 
for every iteration, you only look at a subset of the data. You don't look at the entire projection data. You just look at a part of it, update your image. Now look at another part of it, update the image. Now look at another part of the projection data, update the image. And that actually um, turns out to speed up reconstructions uh, significantly. You can also incorporate prior belief, right? So in the context of Bayesian reconstruction or maximum a posterior map reconstruction, you could have you know, prior belief. For example, you may say, I have a belief, right? That nearby voxels, at least within anatomical organs, uh, which can get guidance by, let's say from CT or MRI, that nearby voxels should be similar in intensity. If you give me a final reconstructed image that has too much difference between two nearby voxels, I'm going to penalize you. So that penalty term you can incorporate in reconstruction in the context of Bayesian image reconstruction. There's a world of investigations around it. We even have products now in the market that, that do this kind of thing. It challenges you often have hyperparameter or hyperparameters that kind of tells you how much do you believe what you believe? How much should I really emphasize this? If I see nearby voxels that are uh, really different in intensity, should I penalize you a little or a lot? So playing with those hyperparameters is, is one of the challenge. But the essence is when you iterate a lot in typical iterative reconstruction, you do get noisier and noisier and noisier images. So typically people just stop, let's say after a couple of iterations with a good number of subsets. But you see, as you iterate more, you do get higher and higher contrast. But unfortunately, you see how these numbers for these tumors are increasing. So higher and higher contrast, but the images are getting noisier and noisier. So you can sort of see that the signal to noise ratio is probably best here. But if you iterate more, you're gonna get higher and higher numbers, but the noise is not catching up and this may not be favorable. But again, with maximum a posterior reconstruction, you have this prior model that you build into this. You know, we will, hopefully we'll talk about the mathematics in the future, but this is a typical likelihood function for a Gaussian model. We could do Poisson model, which we do with MLEM. Don't worry about the details here, but you could build your model, your prior belief as a penalty term. And when you do that, um, instead of, you know, say, deciding between which number of iterations I wanna use, you say, no, no, I'm gonna use a lot of iterations, but I'm going to also enforce my belief. And you may end up with an image here that does have higher contrast and not so much noise, right? So this is an example of a product that is out there. So again, contributions by scientists like yourselves in taking the field forward. Um, so here are some questions uh, for you to try to attempt. And uh, concluding remarks, tomographic imaging, you know, moves beyond 2D planar imaging and that en uh, it enables 3D visualization of images. And that really significantly improves contrast and localization. On top of that, of course, you know, as you surround the patient with more and more detectors, then you can increase the sensitivity. So you're gonna get, you know, improved contrast and also you try to get, have higher sensitivity for less noise. Statistical iterative reconstruction methods have been in routine use in nuclear medicine for decades. It's interesting that in the world of CT, it's only more recently that they're being used. And historically, that's, that's that one reason for that was, you know, you had a lot of different uh, projection information in CT and the count rates were thought to be pretty sufficient. So they said, well, we're just gonna do like typical analytic, you know, FBP type reconstructions. But with a lot of emphasis, you know, in, 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 in recent times on reducing dose to the patients because there's been significant dose to the patients and there's public awareness and, and worry about this issue. There's a lot of emphasis on lowering dose in the CT world. So the CT world, the reconstructions are now starting to look like what we've been doing in nuclear medicine for decades now. And that is iterative statistical reconstruction. And so there's a whole range of applications there. There's a lot of excitement. People are getting, you know, better images at less dose because they are switching to these kind of more advanced statistical uh, or as they would call it model based or iterative reconstructions. And finally, there's significant past and ongoing research on advanced image reconstruction. There's many things you can do and people have tried and people are doing such as modifying the objective function, like the one that for example models the, uh, let's say the Poisson nature of noise. And on top of that, you add the prior, you could play with the prior model. What kind of a prior model of belief do you want to put in there? Uh, using different algorithms to actually optimize this objective function, representing the image using different kinds of basis, basis functions. Who says you have to use voxels? 
why not using overlapping kind of uh, basis functions, and there's been some work in that. And and uh, you know another re really recent example is using deep neural networks in the context of deep learning. You know, compressed sensing has been used, all kinds of things. So so there's a lot of innovation happening, and and um, uh, and I'm sure uh, many of you uh, listening to this lecture are working in this area, will be working in this area, or maybe be making very important contributions. But Anyhow, no matter who you are, if you're working in the field of tomographic imaging, you really need to understand some of the details of, of reconstruction. And thank you very much.